Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning in to one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing the best creative voices across film, television and theatre. And today we're joined by the fantastic Daniel Knopf, who is a creator, writer, showrunner, executive producer and his most recent project, which is coming out soon, is Nickelodeon's The Astronauts, which I was really interested in the fact that this is the first project with Imagine Kids in Film, which is Ron Howard and Brian Grazer and they're diving into this space and was really interested in what that collaboration looked like and what they really brought to the table, particularly given that it's live action space, but for a young audience. And that's obviously a space that they've worked within with more adult content and kind of how that how that looked behind the scenes working with them. Well, I mean, it was, uh, first of all, they were extremely supportive of, uh, of my vision. But then again, I think my, my vision was very much, you know, what their vision was for the mm -hmm. show. And mm -hmm. And um, I mean, like, you know, this, this sort of could have been, well, five kids get launched into space and hijinks ensue. And um, I said, well, if that's what you're looking for, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree. Um, I, I, I was like, what would happen realistically if for some reason five untrained children were launched into space and it's not gonna be hijinks ensue. It's gonna be probably pretty, dangerous and scary and and um uh, what they brought to the party was an absolutely um uh, relentless devotion to um the science and the reality of space travel which they've really you know obviously made their bones in with previous projects um i remember you know and nickelodeon was very much on board for all that too so um, I mean, I remember having like an anxiety dream, like the day before I went up to Vancouver to visit the sets and I was like being shown around and they were like in all primary colors and they, look, <laughs> and it's like, it looked like a, a wall might fall down if you bumped into it and stuff. I was like, oh my God, it looks like a game show set. Um, but when I, I mean, obviously, I mean, I went up there and it was just like, this was one of the most remarkable sets I've ever been on. And, and I've never done, I've never done a space show. So I've never, I've never been. Um, I've, I've never, I've never, I've never had a spaceship at my disposal. So it's like, it was like, wow, this is so cool. And, um, you know, our uh, Jeffrey and, and, and our designer, um, Jeff was, was so, we all talked about the way the ship looks inside. And it's kind of like, this is near future. This is 10 years in the future. So the design, um, sort of the, 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 the um, the design of the ship would be, it it wouldn't be as swoopy as say you know something like Star Trek, um, but it wouldn't look like Apollo thirteen either, where everything was sort of form follows functions and very boxy. There'd be a certain consumer level because the guy who runs the company um, is is sort of it's a private space company and it and, and they manufacture consumer goods. There'd be kind of a consumer kind of mentality there. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of thing you'd see on, say, a private jet or uh, or, or a yacht. You know, the, the the public spaces would be very comfortable, and and um, and uh, but they would reflect the fact that you still are on the spacecraft. And once you remove the skin, like you remove a bulkhead, it's like there's a lot of complicated stuff behind it. You know, so all those things are kind of hidden. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of thought just went into the reality of the spaceship you know, and, and the way it functions. And so um, it was really, it's fun for me because I've never, I've never done a, I've never done a show with these kinds of digital effects and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it's kind of fantastic to watch. Yeah. And because you were mentioning even just the tone of the show, that it really is high stakes, you build a lot of suspense and tension within it. And it really doesn't shy away from that. And it's so interesting when you think of that in terms of, of younger audiences, that the majority of live action programming is all comedy and was really focused on that space. And so I wanted to ask kind of like, what were the unique aspects that that really bought in terms of writing the show and, and crafting that as the tone, but thinking about who the audience was at the same time, given that there's not very many other examples of that. Well, I think in the writing and certainly in the writer's room, I mean, we, what, what we did was it's like, okay, well, you know, writing, writing is for human beings. Um, the, the, there were things that I wanted to do inside the family space that I hadn't, that not that were unprecedented, but I just hadn't seen for a long time. And that was um, characters, uh, you know, 
parents and children that genuinely cared for and about one another. Um, and and um, and and uh, no, none of the sort of broad stuff we see in you know the cheap kinds of 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 um, the the sort of cheap shorthand we see in familial relationships. I wanted to have a certain depth to that. Um, and you know, kids writing for kids. I mean, I've generally, uh, I mean, my body of work is 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 adult themed and and very dark adult themed at that, you know. Um, but I've raised five children, so this is like a space that I've wanted to work in for a long time, yeah, and and just inject some um, some reality into you know into those relationships, and and celebrate things that you know we all have in common, like, you know, um, sacrifice and, and, and courage and uh, um, cooperation, um, the value of those things. So um, we, uh, if there were, there was never a moment in the, in the course of the show ever where I was ever told to, you know, dumb anything down. Um, uh, heck, you know, um, I, I mean, if anything, I'd get like smartened up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so it really wasn't uh, writing. Say the blacklist um, mm -hmm. was no was really not much different than writing the astronauts, um, especially when it comes down to the the compre the story compression aspects of of going to a, 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 sh a, a half hour format, and you're basically putting you know ten pounds of coffee into like a three pound can. Um, and so we, we, if you watch the show, it's like, there's a lot going on in every episode. Mm -hmm. And there's techniques that I brought to the party that I'd really sort of developed in the blacklist as far as how to have two concurrent stories going on at the same time and, and using um, pre-lapping and post-lapping and having voiceover from one scene continuing as another scene is unfolding. And, you know, I mean, just a lot of compression techniques to visual storytelling. Um, that we had to bring to the party, um, and 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 Dean Israelite just, you know that that's kind of like I think that's the way he sees the world. I think Dean gets up in the morning and it's in it's in scenes. It's like suddenly he's in the mirror and he's brushing his teeth, <laughs> slam to Dean in his car on the way to work, <laughs> you know. So uh, it moves right along. Yeah. Is there any difference at all or is it very much the same in terms of character development for the younger characters? Because obviously when you think about things like their backstory, you know, the experiences that they're going to have had in life are going to be very different and not as in depth as, as an older character, or is it really still just, it looks like the same process as any character? Well, I think, I think with children, you know, the, 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 the human that they're going to be is in process, mm -hmm. you know, um, but at this age, at 12, it's pretty well developed. And, and um, each one of the kids has their own sort of distinct voice um, and comes from a different place. Mm -hmm. And most of them don't really know each other. I mean, um, mm -hmm. at the top of the show, you know, some of the kids know some, oh, yeah, I know this girl. She's in, she's in my class at school. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, um, Martin and Doria know each other because they're, they're twins, you know, and mm -hmm. So they've known each other their whole lives. So that's going to have a kind of different, you know, there's going to be a different kind of relationship going on between them. Um, and they're very different people. And, and so once you get a sense of what, I mean, really the questions I ask myself more than, you know, where did this person go to school or, you know, um, is, is, is like, okay, what kind of trauma um, did this person have in the course of their life and what, what scares them and what delights them and what's their, what do they want to be when they, you know, what's their goals? And, th and that's, that's true of adult characters as well is, is um, what is this person's story? Well, you know, where do they, where are they coming from? Which kind of defines where they're going. And as a dramatist tells me, okay, you know, here's where to yeah. drop a big boulder in front of them so they can't get there, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's all the same, it's the same process. I, I just looked at it, you know, to, to writing for adults, um, subtext is very operative. Um, people very rarely say what they mean. Um, you usually have to have somebody back up against a wall. Be, you know, really they've played every 
rhetorical card they can play before they actually get to the truth. Um, children um, are not quite as, there's not so much artifice with children. Um, they'll, 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 um, there's not as much subtext with children. But other than that, it's, it's pretty much the same as writing adult character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something really interesting that you've mentioned in the past about your experience working on Carnival and how you kind of realized very much that particularly in television, that the narrative is just kind of there as an excuse for us to spend time with the characters and the character is actually the most central piece to what you're writing. Um, and I, I was interested in kind of like how that impacted the character development on, on a show like this and if that's something that still holds very true for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I broke into television in my, in my early 40s. Mm -hmm. So I was a consumer of the product for much longer mm -hmm. than I've been a, uh, a creator, um, mm -hmm. a manufacturer. And, and, um, and so I, I really understood. I mean, I, I understand the relationship people have with their television sets and why you turn on the TV and what you're looking for, you know? Um, and um, and so it, it's like, and I take that, that, you know, that delivering those things very seriously. Um, so, I mean, look, you know, you turn on a TV set and, it, and you watch a movie and, and it's very, um, a, a lot of it's very incident driven, you know, um, and a lot of, there's a lot of TV now that's, that sort of mimics film and that a lot of it's very incident driven. But I think at the end of the day, those shows where they, you know, it's all about, you know, okay, well, you know, uh, this happens next, then this happens next, and this happens. Those shows don't have any legs. They don't stay on very long because in a writer's room, you just sort of run out of gas. Is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, okay, what, what can we have them do next? You know, um, mm -hmm. whereas if you have, if, if the reality of TV is, it's TV lives in close-ups in two shots, and mm -hmm. um, really, what it boils down to is you're going. Oh, what's he going to do this week? You know, how's he going to handle this? How's she going to, you know, get past that? Um, yeah. And we even talk about characters we in TV in a completely different way. We have a different vocabulary um, to define our relationship with TV characters than we do with movie characters. Um, mm -hmm. With TV characters, you know, the term "jumping the shark," for instance, is sort of like oh, that show totally jumped the shark when Janet broke up with Jim, you know? Mm -hmm. And how often do we use that same, like, you know, Janet totally jumped the shark when she started going out with, 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 with Joe, you know? Like, she was great, but now she's so boring because he's so boring. So I don't hang out with her anymore, you know? Um, these people, these characters are people we have relationships with and we're invested in emotionally and we're, we're always so disappointed when, when they stop being interesting, you know? Um, because I, I think a part of that is psychologically, they're in our homes, they're in our living rooms, um, they're visiting and, 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 and they become part of our village, you know, part of our personal village. So, mm -hmm. and that, that, One of the know, other that obviously entered into the writing because it's sort of central to the way my, my head works, you know? Yeah, there, there was something great that you said about when you were working on the blacklist, how you really saw it as, you know, if we don't deliver that you're wasting 17 million people's time because mm -hmm. they've chosen to tune in. And is, is that something that still kind of like weighs on you, this unspoken contract that you have with audiences as you're writing? Yeah, that's like my, that's like my coach first day of putting together writer's room talk. Yeah, it's like, you know, we've got to do everything we can do, um, you know, we, most people, when they tune in to TV, they've spent a day and they've come home and they're exhausted and they just want something to make sense. Um, so we got to do that at least. It has to make some sense. They, they can't get confused by it. Um, and so, and that's not, again, not writing down. It just has to be well-crafted. So, you know, you're not, you're not just writing stuff that, that just doesn't make any kind of sense. Um, and the second thing is, you know, entertaining people is, is, is good. Um, and so, it, you know, it's like, it's like hosting a party. You want to make sure everybody has a good time while they're, while they're there. And the third thing, if you can go for it and if you can get it and if you can get it 
you know, is that ecstasy of recognition where somebody sees something and they're identifying, no matter how outlandish the situation is on the TV set, there's some kernel of their lives in it. It's like, I went through something like that. And that character is behaving the way I did. And I'm identifying with that. And, and I thought I was the only one that felt that way, but now I'm seeing this. And it, there's this, this kinship you develop or even better, that character is behaving the way I wish I would behaved. Um, maybe next time when I'm in a situation like that, I'll try to handle it that way. To move people, to change people, um, that's, that's sort of a gold standard uh, as far as, as being a, uh, a dramatist. Um, and, um, and, and, and so you, it's like, yeah, we gotta go for that. Like if we don't make an effort to at least be entertaining, I mean, at least make sense and, and be entertaining, but much less just, or, or much or more, you know, try to make something really great. Um, what's the point? I mean, why get up in the morning? I mean, what? Do, there's all there's all kinds of crap out there. Does the world need more crap? No. So, you know, I I just remember when I watch TV and how often. I mean, all of us you watch TV and you watch an hour and 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 you go, well, that was a waste of an hour. <laughs> no, you know, that was a you know, and it's like you're never gonna get that hour back. You're asking people for the most precious thing in, that they have, more precious than money, you know, is you're asking them for an hour of their life. You're asking for time. And, and, and like, like you just, you know, you just quoted me. It's like we're in the mass media business. And if we're wasting, if, you know, 17 million people toss, you know, just in disgust, toss their, their, their remote on the sofa and go, well, that was a waste of an hour. You've just, smoked 17 million hours of human life <laughs> and it's like oh my god you know i've never done the math but it's that's probably like four or five people's entire lifetimes <laughs> so it's like no like, we got to take this pretty seriously it's terrifying when you quantify it in that way well i'm an, I'm an ex-insurance man so i can't help myself <laughs> On, on kind of a different note, one of the other things that I wanted to ask you about in terms of the astronauts was actually working with, with the cast and with young performers, because I think very much kind of the way that the writing never underestimates them. It's important that when working with them as performers that you don't as well. And, and, but at the same time that what they need in terms of setting up a scene and understanding their character can sometimes be a little bit different. So I was interested in what that looks like with this cast in terms of the way that you worked with them to develop scenes prior to when you would jump into shooting, how you would kind of work to give them feedback and notes to kind of make the adjustments that you needed along the way, along with the rest of the team and the directors on the show. Well, I, yeah, I wish I could speak more to that, but with the COVID situation, we were in a very unusual situation that I was only on the, on the set. Um, uh, when we did the when we did the first two episodes, um, and um, and so um, what we had, what I had, you know, in my what I like to do as a showrunner is you you find people who are really great at whatever task needs doing, and then you go, okay, you go do that, and you don't get in their way, and you don't second guess them, and and as long as everything's working, um, just let them do their jobs, and and. Um, and so I was really, uh, I was I was really fortunate to be working with Nickelodeon, which they do nothing but kid stuff. And so, you know, I was very I very much followed their their instincts and leads when it came to casting, and and casting is important too because you cast the right person, you see him in the read, they kind of, they get the character. And um, J John Huston used to say, you know, directing is casting. You know, you, you shouldn't have to be asking for adjustments, you know, um, um, other than, you know, hey, can, can you say this a little clearer, <laughs> you know, slow it down a little bit, speed it up a little bit. Um, but uh, we had five very, very facile young performers and um, I never really had to sit down with them and say, okay, here's what your character is all about, you know. I mean, occasionally there'd be informal conversations, you know, on, on set that I, I can't even recall really, but uh, about the characters, um, about where they come from. Um, Bryce, I, I really, I had some conversations about, you know, your kid who's born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you've never, you've never wanted for anything and you've gotten everything you could possibly want. 
and um, and you're the saddest kid on earth, you know. And he got that. Uh, I think that kind of thing. But I think as far as the day to day, you know, pulling the performances out of the children, um, that's a question you probably would want to ask the directors um, because they were very much, mm -hmm. especially Dean. Um, Dean's really pretty terrific with kids and I, i'd watch him i'd say god this guy's just hurting cats it's like you know i don't even know how he does it um so um yeah i mean i've had those kinds of relationships um as far as uh collaborative kind of discussions more with adult actors than i did with any of these kids and um you know and and uh but they they all kind of came to it with the essence of the characters pretty much, you know, already inside them. So, you know, there was that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the way that you, you typically work with actors, I know that you've talked as well a little bit about how the most useful thing for actors and the tool that they tend to need is more, where has my character been? What experiences have they had, particularly in television where they don't know where the arc is going, that that's not always something that they they need. And, and I wanted to ask a little bit about that in terms of how much you think about the details that you wanna provide them and how you really support that in terms of the tools that they need beyond what they have that's just in, ter in terms of like the pages of the script. Well, I, I, try, to, I try to, you know, 90% of the time it's self-evident from the pages of the script. Um, and, and, and um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm facile in that way. I don't give a lot of right direct. I don't give a lot of writers notes as far as, okay, you're lying here or you're being deceitful, or whatever um, you're angry. You know, I don't have a lot of parentheticals in my scripts. Um, the line should speak to it. This, this, the, the context of the line should speak to it. Um, uh, you know, there's a million ways to say I love you, and at least half of them are um, are are not nice, you know, um, or cynical or sarcastic. Um, that should be self-evident from from the thrust of the scene, and most of the time, the actors get it. And then, by the way, the kids did too. I mean, I would watch them and they'd say, "Okay, she, they totally you know, they, she got that," you know. Um, I think more along the lines of, of. I mean, I think that I think one of the most one of the most interesting conversations I had with an actor was with Michael Anderson on Carnival, and it, we were you know watching the dailies, and it was like it's not working. He's done. It's not working. What's he doing? What's he doing? And I studied acting for um, about four or five years with a very good coach and mentor, um, and. Cliff Osman and and his whole thing was um, was you know um, was all about you know you got you, you enter every scene trying to win you know um, but in Michael's case I, I sat down and I, I had a sneaking suspicion I knew what he was doing and I we went out to dinner and I said okay Michael talk to me what how do you see this character he says you know well I see this character as he's got this hard exterior. But deep down inside, he's, he's like, you know, molten marshmallow, you know? And I said, you know what? I said, dude, you're, you're blowing the right trumpet, but you're blowing it from the wrong end, you know? Because this character is, he presents himself as very approachable and friendly, but inside, it's, it's tempered steel. And... As soon as I said that, you know, it's so it's so gratifying when you see a light go on in another artist's eyes where they go, "Oh, now everything makes sense," you know, and 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 so you know those those are those are those are conversations you have on occasion where you see him and you're going, "Okay, he's making choices." I know he's a I know he's a, a pro and he's been studying his craft for a long time. What's the rather than saying? you need to say it this way, or you need to say it that way, is saying, okay, um, what's what's the core basis of the choices you're making? And if there's a flaw in that, then everything's not, everything's gonna sort of go off the rails. So once you can kind of nail that down, um, then it's usually very helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's or, or where characters are sort of, playing the subtext and you go, no, 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 no. You're, you're hiding that banana. Like, you know, you 
when you come in, because you're terrified, you should be, there should be twice as much bluster, you know? Um, so there'll be those kinds of conversations, you know? But those, like I said, those are kind of rare. I mean, everybody, if you're working at this level, everybody pretty much knows what they're doing, you know? Oh, sometimes they bring something that I didn't expect. I and mean, that's great. That's like a Christmas present. It's like, wow. <laughs> it's, it's like, I didn't expect him to do that line that way, but it's, it's so much better than, than what I expected or how I, how I thought that. And as your TV is a really cool medium because the more you're working with it, the, you, the more you're aware, you, you know, the, 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 the actor's interpretation of that character supplants the voice that was in your head when you were just writing it when it wasn't cast. So you start writing stuff, you know that, you know, the, this actor's gonna, you know, hit this line right out of the park. You know, you start just sort of throwing them, you know, just start throwing them fastballs right down the line. And, you know, it's like, bam. Yeah. One of the other things that I wanted to ask you about in terms of your work as a writer that you've done a lot of throughout your career as well is, is the art of doing script rewriting and script doctoring, because I think that's such an interesting facet of the craft and was, was wanted to ask you a little bit about when you're taking on a project like that, what the responsibility <laughs> is to the script and the text that already exists and how much you feel like you can take it and reshape it versus how much you kind of need to stick to the central voice that's already there? Or does it really depend on each project and, and what the notes are and what they're looking for from you in terms of what that rewrite is gonna be? Well, I mean, I think, it, I think it all goes to your, my, 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 I guess my basic philosophy is, 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 is as far as delivering entertainment goes is it's not about me, it's about the show. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, people go, I want to make this a Dan Knopf script. I'm going to take this, you know, this, 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 this Janet Smith script, and I'm going to make it a Dan Knopf script. And it's like, that's not your job. Your job is, I think, the, is to say, you know, and then I, again, I've got staff. So I like to sit down, I'll do my pass. Um, and, but I'll usually have a conversation with the writer after that and say, how do you feel about my pass? You know, and, and I'm not expecting to go, oh, it's terrific boss. <laughs> um, I, I want them, I mean, writers aren't very good at that anyway. I mean, um, uh, they'll come in if they're like loaded for bear and they're saying, why'd you cut this scene? You know, I'll say, well, because it wasn't going anywhere. Like I, the scene didn't say anything or move the narrative or reveal any character at all. I don't understand why it was even there, so I cut it. And they're like, no, 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 this scene's really important. And here's the reasons why it was important. And if they have a compelling argument, um, it'll be, you know what, you're right. That scene was critical, but that's not the scene you wrote. So let's sit down and write the scene that you just described here, you know? Um, and and so it's, I think that, I mean, when I've rewritten people blind where I haven't had any interaction with them, it's like, okay, he didn't do this. And he didn't quite get it, he didn't quite carry the ball past the goal line. Um, how do I, how do I do that? How do I, how do I, how do I maintain the trajectory he had and, and accomplish that? And my, I, my goal is for the, the original writer to look at it and go, oh yeah, I wish I'd thought of that, you know? Not, oh man, he totally messed that up. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really just trying to, um, you know, is trying to, to divine what the, what, the, what, what, what the original intent of the writer was and then say, oh, okay, they, they, they approached it wrong here. Um, and, uh, and you can figure that out by looking at all the surrounding work, which is working. And you go, oh, okay, that guy uh, came, came through like a champ here, here, and here, and here's how it did. And here's what, here's what that person's methodology is for it. So let's bring this scene into line with that person's methodology and take it to its a better conclusion maybe, um, or refine it a little bit um, and, or make it, make it clear or, or this, this scene doesn't work. This scene's robbing that scene over there, which he he killed. So I'm just going to cut that scene. Um, 
Uh, it's that kind of decision making. Uh, it's, it's, it's really all about making the material better. It's not about serving the original writer. It's not about serving my ego. It's about making this as good as I can make it, you know? Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of show Bibles, when you're putting together shows, I thought that was a really interesting part of your process because it seems like you've, you really kind of tailor each of them depending on what the show is and the types of materials that you pull together. You've have, had everything from, you know, fake police reports to a lot of graphics included. And so I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about how you kind of map out what you feel are gonna be the most valuable tools in terms of communicating what the show is gonna be, what the central characters are gonna be and what that driving force is gonna be so that when you start taking it out and pitching it, that you have everything that you need that's gonna communicate exactly what you want within that document. Yeah, well, you know, that process, I mean, a process I used to sell called Carnival. That's kind of fallen um, by the wayside because we're, we're, I mean, I don't know what, 500 scripted shows on television, which means that their the networks, various networks are probably, you know, um, yeah, uh, there's probably five times that number of considera under consideration. And you, they really don't want to see, uh, you know, a 30 page, you know, sales piece anymore um the, the over the last year or so i've seen more it's more becomes about you know a pitch going into a pitch but as far as doing bibles when i'm hired to do a bible it's like okay this becomes a series bible um again when i when i first did carnival i'd never done any television ever and and um i remember scott Winant, who i developed that with um, saying, well, Dan, we need to see a Bible. And so they're going, oh, we must really be screwed then. I'm going to deal with the St. James Bible. <laughs> Are we going to kneel down and pray that somebody buys this thing? Um, I, I didn't know what a Bible was. And he described it to me. Okay, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a story where it's going, um, possible future episodes, breakdowns of all the characters, and so I went home and I started working on that, that, that document and I found myself just bored. I was just going, ah, oh, it's just like doing a report in school, you know? And so I went, there's gotta be a more fun way to, to convey this. And plus important things can't be conveyed like tone. How do you convey the visual tone, the, the palette, the, you know, the, it's, it, and so I, I on that, in that case, I just said, I put together this whole document with like you mentioned, fake police reports and fake interviews and fake religious tracts. And it was I don't know, 48 pages or something. And um, I, when HBO got it, they said, oh, wow, we didn't know that this was a true story. <laughs> and it's like, no, I made all that up. That's what I get paid to do. Um, and I had as a graphic arts, you know, major in college and, and illustration. And so all that stuff kind of comes naturally to me. Um, but I recently did one for a project called Sleepers um, that's all set around a college campus. And I put together fake textbooks and fake, uh, a fake um, student handbook, you know? Um, and um, I mean, that, that kind of stuff's really fun for me. I enjoy it kind of, it's, it just falls in that whole world building thing. And, and to me, if, it, if I'm having fun while I'm writing it, that love just gets, you know, gets smeared all over the page. And if that's there, then it'll be entertaining to read and it'll be more likely to get greenlit, hopefully, you know? Um, so, so there's gotta be a certain gusto that you, that you, you know, you attack the page with and, and, and that resonates for the reader. You know, if you're not having fun, they're not going to be having any fun, you know? And so, um, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's the way I approach it. I mean, just Bibles, you know, is kind of cracking open the story and where it's going to go and, and getting, doing some deep dives, you know? I think that's so fantastically insightful. And I wanna thank you so much for, you know, not just sharing your experience working on the astronauts, but your incredible array of expertise with us today. So thank you so much, Daniel. Well, it's my pleasure.